time's a charm, I guess they say. I finally made it into the Nusba al-Shahid, or in English, the Martyr's Monument, here in Baghdad. I first came here in 2003 and wasn't allowed to visit it because American soldiers with tanks had taken over the site. They claimed it, it was strategic. It's not strategic. And I could only photograph it through a razor wire and, you know, from a, from a distance. And uh, it's not easy to visit. They charge you double the price for some weird reason, something about a museum that's closed, and then they told me I can only be here for 30 minutes. But at least I made it inside, and it's here on the Tigris River, and it's a beautiful place. So this, the monument was built by a sculptor, and it was dedicated to the fallen of the eight-year-long war between Iraq and Iran from 1980 to 1988. And it's actually an, it's an iconic spot um, in Baghdad. These are meant to be like Abbasid style uh, cupolas that are, uh, it's, it's like a cupola that's sort of split in two. And um, it is quite beautiful. I mean, it is from the sort of Bathist era of making grandiose monuments. Um, it is a cool place to visit. I'm, I'm glad to have finally been here. I assume they told me they're gonna... I assume they're gonna make good on the fact that they said they'll chase me out of here uh, fairly shortly. I don't know if I'll have time to shoot the photos that I want to shoot, but we'll see. The Martyrs Monument was completed in 1983 in the midst of the Iran-Iraq War. And 20 years later, in 2003, there were American Abrams tanks here. And, um, American troops had cordoned this place off and I remember briefly trying to speak to them through the barbed wire and they told me this place was inaccessible so when I was denied here a couple of times by the Iraqi soldiers that are stationed at the gate which is probably a pretty cushy gig uh, all things considered in the Baghdadi context you know it kind of it kind of reminded me about how difficult this was to access 20 years ago so this monument is now 40 years old and it is it is really cool i love how quiet it is there was one local family here i assume again that i'm going to get the bums rush at any moment before i've had uh, a satisfying amount of time here but i'm just happy to have actually finally made it inside this um iraqi flag sculpture was definitely not here um, in 2003. I don't know if it would have, you know, if it was put there as a sort of post debathification thing. Um, again, the, the Bath Party built this monument. So this is the, I guess this is the entryway to the Shuttered Museum. And interestingly, there are a sort of a collage of photos of uh, Shia clerics that were martyred by the Baathist regime which I can be pretty sure that 40 years ago, this was not the intent of what this was designed for. Because Saddam Hussein saw himself as locked in this civilizational struggle, as I had mentioned in the Takkasra episode, the uh, ancient Iranian ruins south of Baghdad. So I'm, I'm tending to think that this place has probably been repurposed. Although Iraq has recently opened up with its visa liberalization policy, Baghdad is still a difficult city to kind of get around and explore. It's spread out. The traffic is absolutely bonkers. And it's difficult to access a lot of stuff. In the week that I've been here, I have been denied entry into more places than I have been allowed. And I think that is for a couple of key reasons. One is that Iraqi society has undergone a, a number of collective traumas, beginning with, you know, the Iran-Iraq war in the 1980s, and then the war with Kuwait in the early 90s, and then the United States in the early 90s, 
and then you know 12 years later there was another war with the United States and then there was the war against IS in recent years and you know this means that things in Iraq although the country is somewhat stable and is at peace there hasn't been a suicide bombing here in Baghdad for for a good while now I think you could say but you know with the history of Baathism in Iraq which was the the ideology that was promulgated by Saddam Hussein and his acolytes that that still sort of exists here in terms of why things are so difficult for example here at the the martyrs monument there is this the, this martyrs museum which is below the the staircase is there but and you must pay for a ticket for it which makes the ticket double the price but you're not allowed to visit it the doors are chained shut but i was told at the entrance that I must pay for a ticket to the closed museum otherwise I wouldn't be allowed entry and you kind of get the impression that you know even in the 20 years since the United States invaded here and in the about close to six years that the war ended against IS uh, primarily in Al Anbar and Nenoa governates in the west and north respectively Iraq has not healed as a society and this to me is the tragedy of this place. So Iraq is both, it is both wonderful and it is tragic at the same time. The Iraqi people are some of the nicest people that you will ever meet. I mean, from cab drivers to food vendors, to intellectuals, to just people that you meet in ordinary interactions. And it's the people of Iraq rather than its legacy monuments that make this place worth visiting, at least in my opinion. I've just, I've met some absolutely incredible people here. And it, I think it's the Iraqi people why I've come back, you know, in war and peace and seen Iraq through different phases over the last two decades. I mean, this trip means something to me because it marks 20 years since I first entered this country and I've seen it through a lot of turbulence and I'm happy to see it, you know, at the state that it is in now for sure. Um, but I also want better things for Iraq and I want, you know, Baghdad to be a, an even better and safer place and not so quite haphazard. But I think the fact that foreign visitors are allowed now besides just people from the region, like, you know, Iranian pilgrims and whoever else, and, and pilgrims from Bahrain and, and other, you know, nearby places, I think it's a really positive step that outsiders are allowed here now. I think this could be a healing thing for Iraqi society, and that may be a naive notion, but you have to hope for something, even if you have to cling to it. You're going to be able to see my iPhone in the glare of the sun, but there is an American Abrams tank just about exactly 20 years ago, and I was standing about here when I took that photo. I think the very last thing I'll have to say about the Shaheed Monument is that it's almost Soviet in scale, meaning that it's on such vast grounds in the middle of the city. There are no people here, except for maybe a couple of soldiers guarding the place. It, it kind of reminds me of, of sites in Central Asia um, that, you know, are kind of good to look at from afar, but that, uh, yeah, you kind of have to be careful of visiting for some reason or another, or whatever the history is. So I got this very low-key little mezza tray and a drink um, at this modern, mall um, sort of catty, catty corner to the martyrs monument and you're not meant to have cameras in here apparently so and I don't think I'm supposed to be eating either so <laughs> I think by making this video I'm making a couple of rules but I haven't eaten so far today so I'm having a secret little snack here before I walk back to the hotel in the very hot heat crossing the streets in Baghdad can be absolutely brutal if you're walking around this town is not really meant for pedestrians. Sometimes it's good to 
to follow the locals who know the rhythm of the traffic and the social mores. So you stop when they stop. Go when they go. And this is an everyday thing here. And that is how you cross a major thoroughfare in Baghdad. Some very, very dated vehicles here in Baghdad that are part of the city's air pollution issue. I saw a bus yesterday that looked like it was probably from the 1940s, I would say. And the engine seemed like it was on fire. Probably too loud here for you to hear this. Try to follow this water man around. You're not supposed to be drinking water during Ramadan. Shukran Zadik. I, I couldn't make it back to the hotel without getting some water. I, you know, I'm not, I shouldn't be drinking outside publicly in theory, although there is, of course, a Christian minority there, so there's always that factor. But uh, yeah, the water man was weaving his way through traffic and I just, I couldn't, I was trying to make it all the way to the hotel, but I couldn't hold out any longer. Okay, pop. Hello. I bet you're thirsty. On this very hot walk back to the hotel, I've stumbled in a camera repair shop by Torrier Square. And I'm just loving I just love this dusty array of gear. This makes me wistful for analog photography, which is where I started. When I was first here in Iraq, I was shooting analog because although digital existed in 2003, it was far too expensive. So it was either, I had a choice of either coming to Iraq and shooting analog photos, which at the time were just known as photos, versus getting a digital camera and staying home and not coming to Iraq at all. So obviously I made the choice to come to Baghdad and shoot film that I wouldn't be able to get my stories out for long after. But just loving this gear. I've even found an old Panasonic Lumix here, which I think my camera is 10 years old and I think this way predates my camera. In fact, it was when I came home from covering the Iraq war that I realized that I was gonna to have to switch to digital. In Afghanistan in 2001, I would say, I don't know, maybe half the photographers were shooting film and half were digital. But by the time I came to Baghdad here 20 years ago, everyone was shooting digital. All the agency guys, all the, the newspaper shooters, all the people that were here with money were all shooting digital and it was, it was actually here that I think cemented the digital photography revolution, at least in terms of photojournalism. And analog photography was relegated basically to an art with the Iraq War. I, I, that's, that's my take on it anyway. I never shot analog photos seriously after I was here in Baghdad in 2003. It, was, um, it would be the last time that I shot film and had to wait to develop it, didn't know how things were gonna look, and, had to conserve my film. You know, you, you, I came over here with a finite amount of film rolls and, you know, I didn't know how much I needed to shoot and how long I was gonna last here. And God, it was, 20 years ago was such a different time. I mean, I know I'm being, you know, Captain Obvious, as they say, by making a statement like that, but just walking in that dust-ridden camera shop uh, with the friendly salesman there, I just, it just really hit me how much has changed in 20 years, you know? Two decades ago, I would have been happy to have had a lot of that gear. Now it's just all laying in pieces on a shelf, almost like it's a little ad hoc museum on the side of Tahrir Square. I'm doing something very spontaneous on the hot walk back to the hotel. I've met Ali here from Sudan, and I didn't, I actually forgot to bring a watch on this trip. When I was leaving New York, I couldn't find my my watch and Ali has all types of watches and I found this really sweet Seiko and uh, I actually love watches so even though I really shouldn't be buying anything I'm gonna get this even though and it's metal and it's hot out so it's probably gonna burn my wrist but I kind of couldn't resist so right now he's Ali is going to he's gonna fit the watch precisely for my wrist
love like craftsmanship and crafty things and fixing and making things and customizing stuff. So this is this is right up my alley. And voila! Ali fitted me with this Seiko watch. And now I have a watch for the rest of the trip. Now I'm being a little more spontaneous and I'm getting a whole bunch of juice. I'm getting some some orange juice, which is known as Portugal, and some pomegranate juice, which is known as Ruman, which sounds like Roman. I'm not sure what the connection is there, but this guy's got a killer corner juice stall.